Dr. Anderson. Okay. And I believe I'm going to call um, Detective Kelly. Okay. Um, What's your best estimate on how long it will take? Kelly would be, I assume, would be very brief unless I had to, unless he's giving me a difficult time, which I can't imagine. I'm just getting some basic things out of his report. Um, as far as um, medical examiner, probably direct, no more than an hour. And I don't know what the hell long cost will be. Maybe 20 minutes. Well, because I, we're, we're getting into a spot where I could see us, I could see the defense potentially resting by 11. Potentially. And then if we nail down the jury instructions, I could then instruct the jury, and then I just, I don't know that we want to waste a whole afternoon. Now, if we do closing starting at early afternoon, that does up the chance of the jury being sequestered. Sequestered, yeah. So I caught between not wanting to waste their time, but also not wanting to force a sequester on them. Sure. That was our discussion earlier. Yeah. So I may be inclined just to gauge them. Just see if, if given the choice. I'm sure they're going to want to go forward as fast as possible. I would think so too. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that's like the, the Friday at 5 o'clock. Would you rather stay right. like closing still 9 o'clock or come back Monday? Yeah, you it's, know, it's really. <laughs> but, but. Well, but if that's the case, then you almost want to tell them in an abundance of caution to bring it overnight. I'm back. going to. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to tell them there's a chance that they will get the. If things progress as, as we anticipate, right. there's a chance they may get the case tomorrow sometime in yeah. the afternoon. So to go ahead and bring something, uh -huh. an overnight bag. Um, so that's probably what I'm going to tell them. Unless they unless they indicate that they prefer to start earlier in the day on the on first. I mean Wednesday. Yeah, I mean I could give them the option. I can let them, if you guys agree, I can let them... Mr. Harmon, if you guys agree, I can <clears throat> let them make the call. Um, I don't really care. It doesn't matter to me either way. Um, I, I would agree. I mean, um, you know, I, I know generally the most jurors prefer not to be sequestered. Right. But maybe one or two who actually prefers to be sequestered. I, just, I don't know how. I think it's a strong possibility if they take the case in more afternoon. Right. That's a very strong possibility. So that, I think if we tell them that, we let them know we need to let them know that. And maybe, and this is the thing, you know how it works. Some jurors may think it's going to be a court verdict. And, and some, and some may think it's going to be a court verdict in a direction, you know, or whatever. And so. <clears throat> right. I have the same conflict, Your Honor. I don't want to waste an afternoon, but I also don't want them to be sequestered unnecessarily. So it's. And so the court's aware, I did today reach, I did get an email, I just want to let you all know, I did get an email from Dr. Holder, he did receive Dr. Wu's uh, information, and he said he was able to open it and read it. Um, and I inquired of him as his, to his availability later this week, so I'm ready to hear back from him. And, and Judge, if, if there is a second phase, I just wanted to make sure that uh, all of the expert testimony could be done by noon Friday. Because uh, I may have a problem with at least one expert. Well, I assume, and that's another consideration, is that if we don't, if the jury's not working Tuesday afternoon, now we push back closing arguments to Wednesday morning. They, I mean, we now guaranteed um, not starting, if there is a penalty phase, not starting like until Thursday, but you all indicated that you thought we would be able to get it done in two days anyway? I think so, Your Honor. The state has very brief testimony from a medical examiner about uh, HAC and, and then a very, very brief victim impact statement. Um, so that's the state's case. I have to tell you, in abundance of caution, I may be inclined to go ahead and do closings tomorrow and, and, and not get caught in a situation where we're bumping up against a Friday deadline. But I guess on the other side of that, if they, even if they do get the case 
Tuesday, have to be sequestered, and come back Wednesday, I anticipate then we wouldn't, assuming there was a guilty as charged on count one, we wouldn't begin penalty phase till Thursday anyway. Is that right. accurate? Yeah. And Your Honor, I, Mr. Harmon and I just discussed it. I think we both would prefer that the jury, uh, that, that you instruct tomorrow that we do closings first thing Wednesday and let them have as much time as possible to try to avoid them being sequestered. Okay. I, I, do, uh, I do believe that's probably the best route, Judge. I wouldn't want to be sequestered if I have some issues, uh, unless absolutely necessary. And I think if we do closings in the afternoon, yeah. they're almost guaranteed. Yeah. And, and I was going to suggest that uh, maybe if the state does want to depose my experts, we can do it while yeah. the jury's delivering. Yeah. Okay. We can do that. Yeah, okay. That's a good idea. Okay. All right. Well, that will be kind of how we gear ourselves, and we'll just proceed forward and see where we are tomorrow. All right. And I did give you all the jury instructions, and there were a couple, um, if you read them, there are a couple items in there that I had questions or comments about so we can go over those when uh, it's time. All right, let's go ahead and bring them in. <clears throat> All right, jury enter. All right, welcome back. Everyone have a seat. Please stay and call your next witness. Do you call Charlene Forrester? Please stop here first. Face the first piece Do you sum this for for a testimony you about to give this cause that you took the whole keep it nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. May I please step this way, please? You have a seat right up here in the way. Good afternoon, Ms. Webster. Good afternoon. Um, can you please introduce yourself to the jury? Sure. My name is Charlene Webster. My last name is spelt W-E-B-S-T-E-R. And back when you um, issued a report in this case back in 2014, was your last name Forrester? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, can you tell us how you are currently employed? I am a crime laboratory analyst with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement at the Tampa Bay Regional <laughs> Operations Center in the biology section. What do you do as a crime laboratory analyst? As a crime laboratory an analyst, I examine items of evidence for the presence of body fluids, such as blood, semen, or saliva. I may also examine those evidence for epithelial or skin cells to try to determine who may have handled, touched, worn, or drank from an item. I'm then gonna try to develop the DNA profile uh, that I would then compare to the DNA profile of individuals believed to be uh, involved in the case. You just um, used the terminology DNA. Can you explain what um, DNA is or what forensic DNA analysis is? Uh, D forensic DNA analysis is the use of DNA testing uh, to aid in criminal investigations. How long have you been employed with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Since December of 2009. Can you give us a brief educational background? Yes, my educational background includes a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry from the University of Miami. I also hold a Master of Science in Pharmacy with a concentration in Forensic DNA and Serology from the University of Florida. What training experience do you have to hold your position at FDLE? Uh, the training I received uh, was through the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Uh, which was broken down into two phases. Uh, the first phase uh, includes reading several literature articles uh, and doing written, several written uh, tests, uh, competency tests and practical tests, excuse me. And at the end of the first phase, I'm then required to pass an oral assessment. Uh, then I transition to the second phase of the training, which includes uh, supervised casework, uh, mock trial and another competency test, all of which I successfully passed. Is the Florida Department of Law Enforcement also sometimes referred to as FDLE? Yes, it is. And is that lab accredited? Yes, we are. What must be done to maintain that accreditation? Uh, in order to maintain our accreditation, members of uh, ANAB 
bring auditors to our lab where they come in and they examine or review our policies and procedures, our log books, our case files, ensure that our analysts have the necessary training and educational requirements and that we're proficiency tested. It may also include interviewing some of the analysts as well. You mentioned to maintain the accreditation that the analysts are required to take proficiency tests. Can you explain what those are? Yes, a proficiency test is a scenario-based test uh, that's sent to us from an outside agency. I know that I'm being tested, but I don't know the results of the test. When I receive the test, I am to treat the test uh, from start to finish as if I was examining uh, evidence for a case. I will do that, I'll process all of the samples, and then I will report my results to the testing agency. They will then review whether or not my results are consistent with their own and send a memorandum back to our agency letting them know that I successfully passed the test. Are you up to date on your proficiency tests? Yes, I am. After you complete your casework on a particular item, is it reviewed? Yes, it is. And how is it reviewed? Our files undergo two review processes. The first review process uh, is a technical review where another analyst uh, will review my file to show that I have followed all of our standard operating procedures uh, properly when doing my testing and that my results are concurrent with the information that I received. Uh, and then my file then goes through an administrative review, typically by a supervisor, uh, to test their, uh, to show that it's uh, administratively correct. How many cases have you worked in the area of DNA analysis? Uh, hundreds. And have you testified previously in court with regards to your work in the area of DNA? Yes, I have. And how many times? Over 30. Has a court ever refused to allow you to testify regarding um, your work in this particular area? No. This time the state would tender the witness to defense. Any questions? No, thank you. Okay. Ms. Webster, can you explain to the jury what DNA is? Yes. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It is the genetic blueprint for life, uh, and it gives our bodies the instructions to make us who we are. Uh, you inherit half of your DNA from your mother and half from your father. Your DNA is unique except in the case of identical twins. Uh, well, your DNA is found in all the cells of your body except for red blood cells. And your DNA remains the same throughout your life and throughout your body, meaning that the DNA I would uh, obtain from your skin cells would be the same DNA I expect to get from uh, any body fluids. You said we get half from our mother and half from our father. When is it that we get our DNA? Uh, when, during conception. And um, you stated that the only two people that have the same DNA are those um, that are identical twins? Correct. And does our DNA ever change? No, it does not. Is DNA analysis only used such in a case like this in a criminal setting, or is it also used in other areas? It's used in other areas. Such as? Uh, for mass disasters, um, it's used to help identify unidentified remains um, and in paternity testing. Is it accurate to say that DNA is a worldwide accepted science? Yes, it is. And it's used every day to make very important decisions? Yes. Is the majority um, of our DNA as humans um, similar? Yes, it is. Um, and what area um, on the DNA strands, if, it, if the majority of us are similar, what area are you testing? Uh, I'm looking at about 1% of the DNA that is unique amongst individuals. Uh, the remaining about 99% of your DNA is similar in the fact that we all have two eyes, two ears, a nose, and a mouth, the general features. But I'm looking at the less than 1% of our DNA that makes us unique. And how is it that you go about looking at this less than 1%? Uh, there's uh, testing uh, that we perform, um, preferably we, the type of testing we perform is uh, short tandem repeat testing or STR testing, and that's how I'm able to examine the, uh, those areas of the DNA. Are there specific um, locations on this DNA strand that you specifically look at in order to determine um, and make comparisons of the DNA? Yes. Um, how many locations was FDLE utilizing or looking at specifically back in May of 2014? 15. And was 15 the, um, 
the generally accepted number in the scientific community? Yes, it was. Has it since increased? Yes. And what is it now? 21. So now FDLE looks at 21 different locations on this DNA strand? That's correct. Does that in any way affect your analysis or your results um, if back in 2014 you looked at 15 locations versus 21 today? Uh, the 21 today just increases um, uh, discrimin uh, power of discrimination uh, when it comes to my statistic. Uh, and it also helps now for us to be able to communicate with international labs. So that's the biggest change in that. Um, is it fair to say then if you had a match back in 2014 and, and there was a statistic provided to that match, let's say one in 700 um, quadrillion, that that statistic would have only gotten higher with the 21 locations? Yes, typically. You testified a minute ago that the way you look at these um, locations is that you um, go about using an STR test? Yes. Can you explain this STR test? Sure. Well, short tandem repeats, or STRs, are small segments within the DNA that repeat a varying number of times. So I mentioned earlier that you get half of your DNA from your mother and half from your father. So if I'm looking at one specific location on the DNA, the half that you receive from your mother may repeat, those repeat may be seen 12 times, whereas the, the half that you inherited from your father, those repeats at that location may have observed 15 times. So your type would be a 12, 15 at a particular location. In order for me to get to that step, I will break, um, there are four processes or steps that I'll conduct. So in the first step, I'm going to take the sample and I'm going to try to determine or release the DNA from the sample. The second step is then me trying to determine how much DNA do I actually have available to me uh, for testing. The third step is then making billions of copies of those 15 areas that we just talked about. And then the third, the fourth step, excuse me, is to take those copied DNA types um, and separate them by size so they look like peaks on a graph. So those peaks on a graph then go back to, again, that 12 and that 15 would be the two peaks that I expect to see at one location based on those repeats that we talked about. Um, are the four steps, are they also called extraction, quantification, amplification, and separation? Correct. Okay. Um, are there some items that you receive for testing that you know it belongs to someone? In other words, you know this person's DNA was taken. It's a standard that you are to utilize. Yes. Um, is typically that done in the form of a buckle swab? Typically. So if someone were to take um, an extra long Q-tip and rub it on the inside of my cheek, you would expect to find my DNA on that cheek swab. Is that fair to say? Yes. Are there some samples that you receive that you don't know who could have possibly left behind DNA? Yes, that's correct. Are those sometimes called question samples or unknown samples? Yes. And ultimately, is your job to compare a known standard or a known sample to a question sample to determine if you have a match or not? Yes. Whether or not someone can be included or excluded? Correct. Okay. How do you know when you conduct this STR testing that it is done correctly? There are controls that I run with my samples to ensure that my testing is occurring properly. Um, one of those controls is a positive control where it's a known profile that I expect to get at the end of the four-step process that I conduct. Uh, that ensures that my, uh, excuse me, my steps are occurring properly and my reagents are working. Um, then there's also a negative control, which is a blank sample that has no DNA contained, um, and it should remain blank from start to finish, and that ensures that there are no outside DNA introduced into the samples. And is there a kit that um, FDLE was specifically utilizing back in May of 2014 to conduct this kind of testing? Yes, we were using the Identifiler Plus kit. And was... Typically, you can see on sometimes on the news or on television how DNA testing is done by a robot and the chemicals are being applied to the test tubes. Is that how this testing was done or was it done manually? Uh, some of it was manual, some of it was robotic. In order to say that you have a match, do you have to have a match at all of these 15 locations? Yes. 
Um, in order to include someone, do you have to be able to have a match at all of the 15 locations? To include someone, uh, it depends on the information that I have available, um, so that's different. Okay. Um, are there standard operating procedures and certain numbers that are thresholds that must be met in order for you to be able to include someone as a possible contributor to the sample? Yes. What about to exclude someone? Is there a certain number of areas that they have to not match at to be able to exclude someone? Only one. So in order to exclude someone, there's no close enoughs. If they are different at any one of the locations, they are ex automatically excluded. Correct. At any one of the 15 locations. That's correct. Okay. So if you're looking at a 1512 using the numbers you utilized a minute ago, um, and you expect the person to be a 1512 at that location, if, if they are not a 1512, then they are excluded. Is that correct? That's correct. After you determine whether or not someone's included or there's a match, what do you then do? After I determine uh, a match for a sample, I'm then going to try to put a statistic uh, to my match um, and to determine um, how common or how rare I expect to see that DNA profile in the general population. Is that statistic also, um, are you able to give weight basically to your findings? Yes. Do you use a database in order to assist you in coming up with that statistic? Yes, I do. And um, what database was used specifically in this case? The database was developed by Dr. John Butler of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Where do the samples come from to make up this database? Uh, the samples were purchased, they were anonymous uh, liquid blood samples that were purchased from two blood banks uh, when they conducted to make up this DNA profile, uh, excuse me, the database. Was the database reviewed by a population geneticist? Yes, it was. And how um, do you go about calculating um, the statistic, the frequency <coughs> statistic? Uh, in order to calculate the statistic, I would look at the DNA types that are uh, present at each of the 15 location. First, I would take one location, uh, look at the DNA types, and look at those for those types in the database for each of the three uh, different uh, ethnicities that we look at. Um, at each of those, for those DNA types, there are specific frequencies or the amount of times those particular types were observed uh, for each individual that were participated in the database. Uh, I will then use those numbers to then implement them or input them into specific equations, and those equations will tell me how, oh, how, many, how often I would expect to see those DNA types together. I would do that for each of the 15 areas Using the product rule, I would multiply those frequencies across each of the 15 areas, and that would tell me what is the chances that I would see those particular DNA types all occurring at the same time. What are the three ethnicities included in this database? We look at the African American, uh, Caucasian, and Hispanic. And is um, this methodology accepted in the scientific community? Yes, it is. What is your training experience in the area of calculating the frequency to statistic? Uh, I have received training through FDLE, through our uh, training program for analysts. I also took statistic courses in my uh, graduate and undergraduate uh, studies. In order for items to be accepted by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for testing, are there certain protocols that must be followed um, or, or adhered to in order to be accepted for testing? Yes. And can you give some examples of those? Uh, some examples may include um, that a standard needs to have a buckle swap, or a standard, known standard would have to have the individual's names. Uh, items must be packaged in, uh, not, not packaged in plastic, uh, but typically in either a box or a envelope. Uh, they must be dried before they're submitted, items, things like that. Why are these standards in place? Uh, to ensure the quality of the samples that are being submitted, so that way uh, we can preserve the evidence, uh, so there's not uh, any degrade degradation of the DNA. Can you explain how someone might deposit their DNA? 
Uh, there are various ways one might deposit their DNA. Um, by touching something, you may leave some of your DNA behind. Um, if you get cut and you bleed, you may leave your DNA behind, spitting. And are you able to test um, an item for the presence of blood, semen, or saliva, or skin cells? I can test for a possible presence of blood, semen, and saliva, not for skin cells. If you're going to determine whether or not someone left behind skin cells, is that also called touch DNA? It can be, yes. And are, do you typically, when you're doing your DNA testing, are you looking to determine whether or not an item may contain blood, semen, or saliva in order to determine if you're going to be able to conduct further analysis on your DNA testing? Yes, depending on the sample type, I will. Can you explain what you first do when you get um, an item assigned to you? Uh, when I receive a case assignment, uh, I typically retrieve those evidence from our evidence um, section, and then I will store them in my evident, personal evidence locker until I'm ready to examine the items. Uh, when I'm ready to examine them, I will clean my work area uh, with a cleaning agent. I will then lay down a butcher paper or a paper to cover the surface between the table and the item of evidence. I'm also going to be wearing personal protective equipment such as gloves, uh, possibly goggles or hairnet if I need it, um, and a face mask. Um, and then I'm going to process only one item of evidence at a time and separating known from question samples when I'm processing them. Why is it that you test um, or sam take samples from only one item at a time? Uh, to, in to ensure that I'm not uh, cross-contaminating uh, samples. And is that the same reason why you don't have um, known standards opened or around your question standards at the same time? Yes. Um, you stated that you get your items of evidence from the evidence um, area, or is that also called the evidence vault? Uh, it could be the vault, yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you, does anybody have access to that evidence area at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Typically, the persons who work in the evidence section are uh, crime laboratory technicians. They have access. Do you have access to that area? No. Um, so you have to go and check out your item through these individuals, the ones that do have access? Yes. Is how much DNA um, that may be left on an item going to affect your ability or your results ultimately? Yes, it will. And how is that? Uh, the more DNA that's present, the more likely I'm able to get uh, develop a complete DNA profile. If there is less DNA present, I may not be able to get information at all, at all of the 15 areas that I was looking at. Can you explain what a, a mixture is? Sure. A mixture is um, when I observe DNA possibly from more than one individual. So we talked about earlier those peaks on the graph and that you can get half the half from your mom, half from your dad. So we mentioned that there was a possibility you could have two peaks at at least one location. Um, at otherwise, you may have one peak at one location if you're, you're, the number of repeats you observe is the same from your mom and same from your dad. So at most for one individual, I don't expect to see more than two peaks at each of the 15 locations for a sample that's coming from one person. A mixture then now includes, if I'm seeing more than three, three or more peaks at multiple locations, that is an uh, indicator to me that there is more than one person contributing to the DNA profile that I'm looking at, and that's considered a mixture. When you have a mixture, is there a way for you to be able to determine if there's more of one person's DNA versus another person's DNA in that mixture? Sometimes. And are those sometimes um, noted as major contributors versus minor contributors? Yes, they are. Did you become involved in FDLE case number 2014-030-4194? Yes. When was this case assigned to you? May I look at my notes? If that would refresh your mind. May 19th, 2014. 
And did you receive multiple items um, when you were initially assigned the case? Yes, I did. Can you first list, can you list out what items you did receive during this first submission? In the first submission, I received a buckle swab from Ebony Wiley, a swab, KM positive swab from the driver's mat floor, blood specimen standard from Felicia Williams, and a sexual assault kit from Felicia Williams. Did you have any um, bedding in this submission as well? Not in the, it was in the second submission that I received a fitted sheet and a bed sheet. Did you conduct testing separately um, from the sexual battery kit or the swabs that were taken from the genitalia of the victim in this case? Could you repeat the question? Did you conduct your testing all separately on all of these items? Yes. Okay. What other items did you receive other than um, the ones that you previously listed? In the second submission, I received uh, hairs from, a hair from trunk, and then I also received fingernail scrapings uh, from the left hand of the deceased and the right hand of the deceased. I also obtained in a fourth submission, swab A from countertop, swab B from countertop, and a towel from the hall closet. In a fifth submission, I obtained a cigarette butt. And in a seventh submission, I received a broken zipper. Okay. So let's talk about, we're going to talk about all the, um, all of them that we just discussed, other than the zipper, were they contained in one FDLE report that you authored? Yes. Okay. So let's start with the initial FDLE report that you authored with everything but the, the broken zipper. Um, when you received these items for testing, were they packaged properly? Yes, they were. Did you go through and clean your work area before you began your testing? Yes, I did. Um, were the known standards in this case... Um, a blood sample that had been provided from the victim, a buckle swab from an Ebony Wiley, and was there also a buckle swab of the defendant? Yes. Okay. So those are considered your known standards. You expect those individuals' DNA to be located on those items. Is that correct? Correct. The other items, the sheets, the swabs from the countertop, the swabs from the genitalia are included in the sexual battery kit. Are those considered all your unknown, your question samples? Yes. It's your ultimate goal to compare your known samples to these question samples to determine whether or not someone's DNA may be on those question samples. Typically, the, the, using the, the question, yes, that's, that'll be right. Did you conduct testing on these items prior to them going on for DNA analysis? Did you test them for blood, semen, or saliva? Some of them, yes. Is that also what's called serology testing? Yes. Um, when you conduct serology testing on these items prior to sending them on for DNA analysis, do you risk using up the DNA that could possibly be there that you may not be able to find if it goes on for further testing? Sometimes. Uh, it depends on how much uh, sample was available to me, um, and it depends on the type of sample. Has Florida Department of Law Enforcement generally, do they not do serology testing now in hopes of being able to get DNA better DNA results? We still do serology testing. Um, we just don't do serology on uh, sexual assault kits. And is that because all the sample, the entire sample is, you don't want to use the entire sample that you might not be able to get DNA results otherwise? Yes, and to reduce uh, time that it would take, it, it less shortens the time that we would need to process those samples, just taking all of our sexual assault kit samples and testing them all. So let's talk about um, the vaginal swabs. Was there any presumptive tests done on those? 
Yes. And when I say presumptive test, was there any testing for blood, semen, or saliva? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what was done on the, the vaginal swabs? The vaginal swabs, I test for the possible presence of blood and for semen. What was your result with regards to the testing for semen? No semen was identified on the vaginal swabs. What about the testing for blood? The vaginal swabs gave chemical indications for the presence of blood. When you go about doing this initial testing to determine whether or not there's blood, semen, or saliva, can you explain what you do? Sure. Uh, for blood, uh, whether or not I'm doing blood or semen or saliva, I'm going to uh, make sure I run my controls for those particular tests. So I'm going to run a positive and a negative control to ensure that my tests are working. Then I'm going to take a small sampling of the swab or the fabric and uh, I will apply a liquid reagent that will then produce a color change test, typically for those presumptive tests. If the color changes, that usually is a positive indication um, of, of a result. If there is no color change, then it's negative. For semen, I will then go ahead and do a confirmatory test, either in the form of trying to visualize sperm cells, or I may do a secondary test if I can't visualize sperm cells uh, for a specific antigen that the male produces. And it, when you're doing your visual examination, is that where you prepare a microscope and look under a microscope to see if you see sperm cells? Yes. Did you test the rectal swabs, the nipple swabs um, for semen? Yes, I did. And what were those results? No semen was identified on those swabs. Let's talk about the towel from the hall closet. Um, did you test that either for blood or for semen? I tested it for both. And what were your results? No semen was identified on the towel from the hall closet. Uh, but the towel did give chemical indications for the presence of blood. Even though you got negative results for the presence of semen on the vaginal swabs, the nipple swabs, and the, um, the rectal swabs, did you still send those off for DNA testing? Yes, I did. Um, and when you, you can, did you use the STR testing when you did that? Yes, I did. Did you find any um, DNA that did not belong to the victim or that was foreign to the victim on those swabs? No, I did not. So since you had a positive presumptive test for blood on the vaginal swabs, is it consistent then that that came from the victim? Yes, Since there was that. nothing foreign on that swab. You could say that, yes. We discussed the towel a minute ago that you said was also a presumptive positive for blood. Did, was that sent off for DNA testing? Yes, it was. And how do you go about submitting a towel um, for testing? I would typically choose areas or select different areas on the towel uh, that I would take a sampling from or, or a cutting and place that in a tube and then perform my, uh, those steps in the STR that I mentioned earlier. And they go through the extraction, the quantification, amplification, and sequencing process? Yes. And did you obtain any results with regards to the DNA testing as to the towel? Yes, I tested three areas on the towel. Um, for side A of the towel, I was able to obtain a complete DNA profile from the towel, and this DNA profile matched the DNA profile from Granville Ricci, um, and there was a possibility of an additional contributor to the DNA profile that was not suitable for comparison. 
Well, so let me stop you for a minute. When you say that you got a complete DNA profile, um, was that, does that mean that you found a profile for all 15 of those locations? Yes, I had information at all 15. And you said that those matched the DNA of Granville Ritchie. So did it match at all 15 locations? Yes, it did. Um, you stated that there was an additional contributor to that towel. Were you able to determine um, who that DNA belonged to? No, as it uh, was only one peak uh, separate that was very low in comparison to the rest of the profile, um, I could not attribute that to an additional person. Uh, that's why it says it's a possibility that it could be an additional contributor, but it's not suitable for me to use for any form of comparison. And did you, um, did this go through the, or did you assign a frequency to statistic to your results with regards to the towel? Yes, I did. Uh, the frequency of occurrence for the DNA profile side A um, for unrelated individuals is approximately 1 in 40 quintillion. 1 in 40 or 1 in 140? Excuse me, 1 in 140 quintillion. So when you say 1 in 140 quintillion, that is more than the number of people on Earth? Yes. Um, so let's say there were 140 quintillion people on Earth. When you say 1 in 140 quintillion, does it mean that you would have to pass through 140 quintillion people before you would find someone who would have the similar DNA profile as the defendant in this case? If, or yes. as Granville Ritchie? If, if yes. If the, DNA, if it was, the DNA profile did not match Mr. Um, Ritchie, then the chances of me seeing that profile again in the general population would be 1 in 140 quintillion times. And how many people are on Earth at this point? Approximately seven and a half billion. That's a one with nine zeros. You said that there were three total areas that you tested in the towel. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And um, was there an area B and an area C? There was an area B, which I also obtained a complete DNA profile, and an area I identified as AKM. And for that particular sample, it demonstrated the presence of a mixture. I could assume that two donors uh, were contributing to the mixture, and that way I was able to determine a partial DNA profile for the major contributor and a partial DNA profile for the minor contributor. The major DNA profile is consistent with the DNA profiles from, obtained from the towels side A and side B, which I matched to uh, Mr. Granville Ricci. So the major contributor on um the other two cuttings were consistent as coming from Granville Ritchie? Correct. Did they have the same, same statistic or was it different? It would be the same statistic. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Let me double check. I may have misspoken. No, it's the same. Were you able to determine whether or not um, the victim, Felicia Williams in this case, or Ebony Wiley could be included or excluded from the towel? Felicia Williams and Ebony Wiley are excluded as the source of the minor DNA profile from the towel, from the closet, sample AKA, AKM. Moving on to the, um, the fitted sheet and the bed sheet. Did you conduct any serology testing on um, either one of those items? Yes, I did. Um, let's start with the bed sheet. What uh, serology testing was done? Uh, semen was identified on the bed sheet. And what about the fitted sheet? The same. Semen was identified on the fitted sheet as well. Were... Um, those items or cuttings from those um, items sent on for DNA testing? Yes, it was. Were there multiple <laughs> cuttings taken from each of the items and submitted on for DNA testing? Yes, there were. Okay. Let's start with sample B and C from the bed sheet. 
Were you able to determine whether or not there was a single profile there or if there was a mixture? For samples B and C, uh, those profiles demonstrated the presence of a mixture of at least two individuals. Were you able to determine whether um, the major or minor contributors? Uh, in this case, I assumed that Granville Ricci was a donor to the mixture, and I was able to obtain a complete foreign DNA profile from samples B and C. This D, the foreign DNA profile from samples B and C matched the DNA profile from Ebony Wiley. When you say that you assume that Granville Ritchie's DNA is going to be on those bed sheets, did you have information that those were, in fact, the bed sheets that he utilized? Yes. And is that why you make that assumption that you're going to um, assume that someone's DNA is going to be on either a piece of clothing that they may wear or an item such as a bed sheet that they're going to be laying on? Yes. Depositing cells? Yes. Okay. Do you have an entire police report before you conduct your testing, or do you obtain any information from law enforcement before you begin your testing to have this kind of information? I don't have the re police report, but I did uh, call and speak to the detective in order to determine that information. Okay. Was the foreign DNA profile that you found on this particular mixture in B and C, was that a complete foreign DNA profile? Yes, it was. So it was all at all 15 locations? Yes, it was. And at all 15 locations, it matched the DNA of Ebony Wiley? Correct. Is that consistent with if Ebony Wiley and Granville Ritchie engaged in sexual intercourse on these bed sheets, that those results are consistent with that? Yes, that could be possible. Did you have calculate a statistic with regards to this um, analysis area? Yes. The frequency of occurrence for the foreign DNA profile from uh, samples B and C uh, for unrelated individuals is approximately 1 in 21 sextillion. Was there any other DNA um, located on either sample B or sample C? There was a possibility of an additional contributor to the foreign DNA profile from the bed sheet in sample C, which wasn't suitable for comparison. Moving on to um, the bed sheet sample D and F, were you able to obtain any results from those sample areas? For the bed sheet sample D, it demonstrated the presence of a mixture of at least two individuals, and assuming that Granville Ricci was a donor, a partial foreign was obtained. Um, and for sample D of the bed sheet, it also demonstrated the presence of a mixture of at least two individuals, assuming that uh, Granville Ricci is a donor to the mixture, a complete foreign DNA profile was obtained. I'm sorry, for D, there was a partial foreign DNA profile, and then is it, you said sample D twice, so is it sample F? I'm sorry, sample F. Okay. So sample F, there was a complete DNA profile? That is correct. Okay. In both of those, since it came from the bed sheet, you assume that Granville Ritchie is included in that mixture. Is that correct? That's correct. Looking at um, sample D, the partial foreign DNA profile, and sample F, the complete foreign DNA profile, did either one of those um, match either Felicia Williams, the victim in this case, or Ebony Wiley? Felicia Williams and Ebony Wiley are excluded as a source of these DNA profiles. So it is some other individual that you not, did not have their known standard, is that correct? That is correct. Was there a sample A area on the bed sheet? Yes, there was. Did you obtain any results from that? No DNA results were obtained uh, from the bed sheet sample A. 
So was there no foreign DNA, or what do you mean by no results? I didn't get any DNA types at any of the 15 locations, so I didn't have any information at all. Okay. Did you have a sample E on the bed sheet? Yes, I did. And what were your results with regards to that? The DNA profile obtained from the bed sheet sample E demonstrated the presence of a mixture of at least two individuals. However, due to the complexity of the mixture that I obtained, uh, this data was not interpretable. Is it fair to say that there were too many individuals at that location to be able to determine who was included or excluded from that mixture? Uh, it was the it was partially very limited in the amount of information I could tell there that there was at least two people contributing to the mixture, uh, but there was indications there could be more. Um, and because of the low level of the sample, I couldn't make any conclusive DNA type drawings or any interpretation. Was there a sample G on the from the bed sheet? Yes, there was. And what were your with results with regards to that? The DNA profile obtained from the bed sheet sample G demonstrated the presence of a mixture of at least three individuals. Assuming Granville Ricci is a donor to the mixture, a mixed foreign DNA profile was obtained, and the DNA profiles, but the DNA profiles of the major and minor foreign contributors could not be determined. Um, since you weren't able to determine the major and minor contributors, were you able, to the foreign DNA, were you able to include or exclude either um, Felicia Williams or Ebony Wiley? Ebony Wiley is included as a possible contributor to the foreign DNA uh, mixture, and Felicia Williams is excluded as a contributor to the mixed foreign DNA profile. Moving on to the swab from the driver's floor mat, um, as well as the swabs from the countertop, uh, A and B. Did you conduct serology testing on those items? Yes, I did. And what were your results with regards to those? The swab from the driver's floor mat, the swabs from A of the countertop, and the swabs B from the countertop failed to give chemical indications for the presence of blood. Were those sent on for further testing since they you got a negative result? No, they were not. Okay. The fingernail clippings and scrapings from Felicia Williams, was any serology testing conducted on those? No, there was not. And um, did you conduct DNA testing on those items? Yes, I did. And what were your results? Partial DNA profiles were obtained from the fingernail clippings or scrapings uh, from the left hand and the right hand. Uh, no DNA results foreign to Felicia Williams were found on the fingernail scrapings, strip, uh, scrapings excuse me, left hand and right hand, um, so there was nothing there. So nothing foreign belonging to Felicia Williams? Nothing foreign. Were you able to obtain a complete profile for Felicia Williams on those items? I was able to only obtain a partial DNA profile from each of the fingernail samples. Okay. Can water, including salt water, affect what DNA might be left behind on an individual? Yes. And how is that? Uh, water uh, would rinse off any DNA that might be possibly present. Um, it would just be like showering. If skin cells were left behind? Yeah, those wouldn't be there also. Um, would the same go for if any sperm cells or semen were left behind? No, those wouldn't be present either. If someone were to wear a condom, generally, is that going to affect the ability for you to find semen or DNA on an item? Yes, that could.
there was um, a hair that was collected um, from a, um, a trunk vacuuming. Were you able to conduct any DNA analysis on that particular item? No, I did not because the hair was not suitable for testing. When you say it's not suitable, what do you mean by that? Uh, I examined the hair under a microscope, uh, looking at the root end of the hair to determine if there could be uh, any tissue that may contain DNA. Uh, these particular this particular hair uh, did not demonstrate that, so I did not take it on for STR testing. Did you locate any hairs on any of the items that had been submitted to you from the list that we just went through? Yes. I collected apparent hairs from the towel from the hall closet and the fitted and bed sheet. Did you send any of those hairs off for DNA testing? The hair, there, were, there were hairs uh, that were suitable for testing identified on the fitted and bed sheet. However, the hairs from the towel from the hall closet were also not suitable for any STR testing. So you weren't able to do any STR testing on any of the hairs, is that correct? I did on the hairs from the fitted and bed sheet. Did you obtain any results with regards to those from the, the bed sheet? I did not obtain any DNA results from the apparent hair from the fitted sheet or the bed sheet. Okay. Lastly, the cigarette butt. Um, was any serology testing done on that particular item? No, there was not. Was that sent on then straight to DNA testing? Yes, it was. And were you able to um, have an opinion or get any DNA results from that particular item? A complete DNA profile was obtained from the cigarette butt. Uh, this DNA profile was consistent with originating from a male individual. Granville Ricci, Felicia Williams, and Ebony Wiley are all excluded as a source of this DNA profile. And when you get these items, for example, the cigarette butt, were you aware that, that this was found on the ground in the area where the body's body was found? Not that I recall. Okay. So sometimes you have information from law enforcement as to why they're sending you a particular item, and other times you do not. Is that fair to say? That's fair. Um, if you have any particular questions, you contact the detective to verify why you might be testing an item? Yes. So from the list that we just went through, um, there was blood on the vaginal swab that was consistent with the victim's DNA? Correct. And then um, there was DNA belonging to the Ebony Wiley and the defendant on the bed sheets. Is that correct? Yes. Moving on to the broken zipper that was submitted to you for testing, um, do you recall what was the purpose of you testing that, or what were you doing? Um, yes, the broken zipper was submitted um, to the possibly determine touch DNA on the sample. Was any uh, serology testing done on that then? No. And so it was went straight on specifically for DNA testing? Yes, I would have collected a sample and just taken that sample on for DNA. Did you obtain any DNA results from the broken zipper? No DNA results were obtained from the broken zipper. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Ms. Webster, I'm going to take you back to bed sheet sample D and F. We originally, you originally discussed that on sample D there was a foreign DNA profile and on sample F there was a complete foreign DNA profile and Ebony and um, Felicia Williams were both excluded from those areas. Is that correct? That is correct. 
The foreign DNA profile, though, from sample D and sample F, did they come from the same person, or were you able to determine if it was, in fact, the same person? Yes, the foreign DNA profiles from sample D and sample F uh, are consistent with originating from the same female individual. You said same female individual? Correct. Okay, so both of those samples originated from some female, but you did not have that foreign DNA profile for that female, is that correct? I didn't have a known profile that matched that foreign profile, that's correct. Thank you, nothing further, Judge. Hey, Cross? No, thank you, Honor. Okay. May this must be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, state card next witness. State we call Dr. <laughs> Christian Whale Wells, excuse me. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Would you please state your name and spell both names, please? Uh, my full name is Eric Christian Wells, um, E-R-I-C-C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-W-E-L-L-S. All right. And, sir, how are you employed? I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of South Florida. How long have you worked for the University of South Florida? Um, about 17 years. Can you tell the jurors your educational background? I have a bachelor's degree and a master's and Ph.D. in anthropology. And where did you receive those? A bachelor's degree from Oberlin College and the master's and Ph.D. from Arizona State University. And prior to working at the University of South Florida, did you do any work at any other um, institutions, no. any other colleges? No. All right. So you started here at the University of South Florida? Yes. All right. And you've indicated you work in the um, Department of Anthropology, is that correct? That's right. And what is your... your uh, your title there? Uh, the title is Professor of Anthropology. Can you tell the jurors um, your work experience in any continuing education that you've received as a forensic um, anthropologist? Um, so in my role as Professor of Anthropology, I've uh, served on a number of forensic archaeology um, research projects uh, over the years. Um, I've run a, a laboratory of soils research, and we focus specifically on geochemistry of soil and sediment samples. Um, and we have analyzed thousands of samples from all over the world uh, over the past 17 years. And this has um, provided data for um, over 100 scientific papers and publications probably about a third of which deals specifically with the, the geochemistry that's involved in this situation. And many of those uh, have, involved, have been involved with uh, specifically forensic cases. Does the Department of um, Anthropology at the University of South Florida, do they provide um, different forensic services to local, state, and federal law enforcement? We do. We, we routinely supply um, all kinds of support services um, and not just in the, the geochemistry, but in human remains identification, uh, facial reconstruction, a uh, wide variety of, of services. Okay. And forensic um, anthropology, would that include the identification of remains such as bones, determining um, sex, origin, um, injury to the bones that could possibly uh, lead to an um, opinion as to cause of the death of the person? That's correct. And prior to your work in this case, have you personally consulted with law enforcement agencies in the area of geochemical analysis? Yes, I have. In your career, how many times have you performed geochemical analysis of soil or sand? Um, I can't say in particular, but in the hundreds of times. Okay. And you said that you have been involved, your, or at least your department has been involved in collection of soil and sands from different places around the world? That's right. And analyzing that sand? Correct. 
um, is the anthropology section at the University of South Florida, including yourself, involved in the, uh, or have you been involved in the um, investigation of the Dozier School for Boys project in Mariana, Florida? Yes, my colleagues and I have, have worked there since 2012, and we continue to do so. And did you perform soil work there or forensic soil work there? Yes, I was in charge of the, the soil analysis and all of the archaeology. And did that project, and that was a project, the, the entire thing is a project involving several scientists, I would assume? That's right, we were a very large group. Did that involve the exhumation of remains that had to be first located? Yes. And then trying to determine cause and origin of the person and the cause of death? Correct. And identifying remains? Yes. <clears throat> Your Honor, I would uh, tender Dr. Wells as an expert in the area of geochemical analysis. No okay, very good. And Doctor, can you tell us uh, how long has geochemical analysis been conducted in the forensic setting in law enforcement in the criminal justice setting? In, in forensic science, um, since the 1970s or 1980s, and then it's become much more common in, since the 1990s when the analytical instrumentation became more affordable and more widespread. Uh, and that's when I started um, working on it as a graduate student in the 1990s. Okay. And is geochemical analysis, is that utilized in other settings, industries, other fields other than forensics? It's used throughout geology, geography, archaeology, forensics, wide variety. And is geochemical analysis accepted as a reliable um, scientific method of analyzing soil and sand and its components? It is. There are uh, a wide number of um, textbooks, uh, and we teach it uh, generally in, in, at the university. Can you explain to the jurors what the science and the field of geochemical analysis of soil and sand, what that involves? Um, so this particular type of analysis is often referred to as sediment fingerprinting, where we can analyze the chemical constituents or the chemical residues in sediments and determine a specific chemical signature that's unique to each uh, group of soils or group of sediments. That uh, unique signature is produced not only by natural formation processes, uh, wind and water action, erosion, uh, but also by human activities and the variety, unique variety and combination of human activities that impact the soil to change its chemistry. So unique chemical signatures can be determined and then the causes can be either from natural or from um, interaction with humans and the other industrial environments? That's correct. Would it be... Um, is that what gives it the uniqueness of the soil, um, its uh, power, I guess, in the forensic setting? Yes, it's the combination of uh, human activities and, and natural activities that create unique chemical signatures. When you're doing and conducting your analysis of sand or soil, what is it that you are looking at? You mentioned earlier components. What exactly is it that you are looking at to determine uniqueness in that sample versus, say, another sample? So we consider um, many of the chemical elements that you might find in the periodic table of elements. Uh, some of those are very common and so aren't very useful for distinguishing between different soil types. Uh, and then there are others, uh, for example, in this case, transition metals like copper and titanium and zinc. Uh, that appear differentially in different um, sediment uh, samples. And so we can use those groups of uh, chemical elements as sort of a, a key or a fingerprint to identify specific samples. Can sand or soil that is found in the same vicinity, such as maybe within a city block of each other, so maybe two or three hundred yards from each other, um, but at different locations within that city block, can they have... Um, different unique elementary chemical proportions and components. Yes, absolutely. And is that the um, unique chemical signature that you're talking about? Yes. And that can occur in a very short distance or a very short um, space. Yes, it all depends on the combination of human and natural activities that took place in a particular area to impact the chemistry of the soil.
if sand or soil is recovered in a criminal investigation, such as on a person's body or in a vehicle or in a container, can it be compared to a crime scene or location to determine if it matches the sand or soil from that location? Yes. Is that an analysis and a comparison that you've done in the past? Yes. <clears throat> Can you also, through geochemical analysis or sedimentary uh, printing, fingerprinting, can you also exclude sand or soils as coming from a certain area? Yes. And is it the same process? It is. Did you conduct that process and that type of analysis in this case? I did. As part of the analysis conducted in, um, in your work at the University of South Florida, when you're Consulting with law enforcement, like you did in this case, will you ask them to collect samples from nearby locations? Yes. And why do you do that? Um, in any kind of scientific study, you want uh, controls to compare your analysis to to make sure that um, the sediments under study, um, the, the uniqueness of the sediments under study, don't overlap with those controls. Okay, I'm going to call your attention back to May and June of 2014. Did you consult with the Temple Terrace Police Department in this case involving the um, investigation of the homicide of Felicia Williams? I did. And in your consultation with um, the detectives in this case, did you learn that sand had been located inside of a motor vehicle that was suspected of having been used to transport the victim's body to a scene? Yes. Um, during your consultation in this case, did you ask the investigating officers to retrieve samples of sand from that actual location? Uh, they had already done so. Okay. And, and I'm talking about the, the location where the body was located? Yes. All right. And did you also ask the detectives to collect sand from other locations? Yes, for and control that, samples. To act as your control samples? Yes. And is that following a standard procedure doing so to get those control samples? Is that a standard procedure in the field of geochemical analysis yes. or sediment fingerprinting? Yes, it is. Okay. Did the Temple Terrace Police Department submit to you the sand, first of all, that was collected from the suspect's vehicle? Yes. And did they also submit to you sand that was collected from the scene where the victim's body had been recovered? Yes. And did they submit to you sand that had been collected at areas in another location to act as your controls? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as states AA-1 and AA-2. Let's look at AA-2. Do you recognize that packaging? Yes. Okay. And was this one of the collections from the front interior um, of the 1998 Lexus? Yes, I believe so. Sand soil from passenger front. Mm -hmm. And that indicates on there it was collected by a Detective Elmer, is that correct? That's right. Okay. <clears throat> States AA-1, you recognize that? Yes. Okay. And was this another item that was submitted to you as being marked from uh, sand soil from the passenger back uh, interior of a 1998 Lexus by Detective Elmer? Yes. Okay. Now, obviously these two bags are empty, so let me ask you, and I, before we, I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit, before we get into your analysis, did your analysis consume these samples? They did. Okay. Okay. 
I'm going to show you states AA A A1, 2, 3, and 4. I'll start with 1. And I ask, first of all, do you recognize the packaging? Yes. Was this item submitted to you, to your laboratory? Yes. Okay. And was this indicated as being sample B, a dirt sample from the south side of the access road at the location of where the victim was located? Yes. Okay. A-2, you recognize the package and the uh, label on the package? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize this as being one of the items that was submitted to your laboratory? I do. All right. And is this labeled as states, I'm sorry, as uh, A, a dirt sample uh, from the parking lot area of the northwest corner of uh, Bridge? Yes. A3. Do you recognize this package and or a label on it? Yes. Is this another item that was submitted to you by the Temple Terrace Police Department? Yes. All right. And is this labeled on the package label as C, control sample from Hyatt Hotel Clearwater? Yes. Thank you. A-4. And I'll ask, do you recognize this item? Yes. Is that one of the other items that was submitted to yes. your um, laboratory? And is this marked as D, control sample of dirt from Belcher um, and Gulf to Bay. Avenue and Gulf to Bay? Yep. Okay. All right. Now, all four of these samples were they greater in volume than the samples that were recovered from the Lexus. Yes. And so they were not fully consumed in your analysis and testing? That's right. And finally, did you conduct analysis on those four items and on the two items that we looked at initially, the, the sand or dirt recovered from the Lexus? Yes. And you've indicated that in your analysis, the sand that was recovered from the Lexus was consumed in your testing? That's right. Can you tell the jurors how you went about conducting this analysis? So for each of the uh, soil samples, I weighed out uh, approximately one gram of sediment and we apply a mixture of very strong acids, uh, hydrochloric acid and hydrofluoric acid. And over a period of about a week, uh, application and reapplication of that acid breaks apart the sediments into the elemental constituents, into the chemicals, uh, so that what you have at the end result is a liquid sample. So you're turning a sediment sample into a liquid sample. Then you inject that liquid sample into uh, a, a physical chemical instrument called inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. Um, and I can describe how that works if you like. If you could, uh, yeah. Uh, the, so the sample, the liquid sample, is aspirated into an ultrafine mist. And that's drawn into a chamber filled with argon gas that's about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. It's about as hot as the surface of the sun. And in that environment, the electrons that it, uh, go around the atoms of each of the elements, uh, move to outside of their um, orbits into other orbits, 
and as they relax back to their base state, they emit, uh, wave, they emit energy in the form of a wavelength, uh, in the form of light. And the, the solid state detector on the mass spec detects that wavelength, and different elements have different wavelengths, so that when we detect an, a wavelength for titanium, we can identify that there's titanium in the sample, for example. And then the intensity of the wavelength, or the intensity of the light, is analogous to the concentration of that element in the sample. So a stronger uh, intensity, a brighter light, is analogous to a higher concentration of that element in the sample. So by doing that, are you able to determine the concentration levels and the presence of certain elements? Right, the presence and then the concentrations of all the, the elements that we're interested in. And after that testing, for each sample, are you able to determine the proportions in which those elements exist in relation to each other in that sample? Yes. And is that what gives you the um, unique fingerprint for that sample? Yes, then we can compare that combination and concentration of elements in each sample and see which ones are similar or different from one another. Does plasma mass spectrometry, spectrometry <laughs> is that a commonly accepted method of analyzing soil and sand samples in the um, general scientific field of geochemical analysis? It is. And is that pretty much the gold standard? It is. And in fact, is mass spectrometry used in multiple fields, scientific fields, including toxicology and other fields? A wide variety of fields, yeah. Did you, um, Doctor, prepare a report in this case as to your findings? I did. Did you uh, provide that report to the Temple Terrace Police Department? Yes, I did. So I want to go back and talk about uh, your findings reference the samples from the Lexus versus the samples that were collected at both the um, location where Ms. Williams' body was found and the other control sample areas. All right, and I'll take it one by one. Um, after you conducted your analysis, did you compare the results of your chemical analysis of the sand from the GS400, both uh, front and rear passenger seat, to the chemical analysis um, and the results that you found for the soil from the scene where Miss Williams' body had been recovered, which would be B? Yes, I did. Okay. What were the results of that and, um, comparison, your analysis and your comparison? The uh, sediment from the front seat uh, passenger, uh, the floor mats, um, had a 99.5% a 99, a 99 match to the sediments recovered uh, from the location of the human remains. Okay. Now I want to ask you about that. Um, is expressions and statistics like that, is that um, something that's commonly done in, in geochemical analysis? Yes. Yeah. And do you have training in statistical analysis and in the ability to express statistical or make statistical expressions as to your findings? Yes, I do. All right. Can you explain to the jurors what your training is in that and your education in that? Uh, it was a standard part of uh, the coursework I had in graduate school, and then I've used it on most of my research projects over the past 17 years. And I'm the one in charge in our department to teach introductory and advanced statistics methods and modeling. And I've done so for about 15 years. All right. And I didn't really get into that with you. Are, you are a professor within the University of South Florida? Yes. In this field? Yeah. Yes. And in other fields? Related? Related fields. Um, is using statistical expressions to uh, indicate the results of your geochemical analysis, is that a commonly accepted practice within the field of geochemical analysts? Yes. <clears throat> now, comparing the uh, results of your analysis of the sand located in the Lexus to uh, B, or I'm sorry, to A, which was the sand collected by the bridge on the Courtney Campbell Causeway, mm -hmm. what were the results of that comparison? Um, that one, I believe, the uh, rear... Uh, passenger uh, uh, floor mats, the sediment from the floor mats, had uh, about a 70% match to the, the parking area.
and what were the results of comparing the, um, let me rephrase, when you compared your geochemical analysis results of the sand from the Lexus to the control sample, and I believe it is C from Clearwater Beach from the Hyatt, mm -hmm. what were the results of that comparison? Um, there was a, for the sediment in the front passenger uh, side floor mats, there was a 0.4% chance of match. A 0.4% chance, so less than 1%. Less than half of 1%. Would you consider that to be an exclusion? Yes. Okay. And moving on to the last, um, I guess would be D, the sand recovered at Belcher and Gulf to Bay. What was the results of the comparison of the sand, the analysis, uh, analysis of the sand from that location to the analysis of the sand from the Lexus? There were no matches. That, that was geochemically very distinct. Okay. So completely excluded. And your expression of 99, I believe it was 99.95% that the front passenger seat sand matched to the sand from where Alicia's body was recovered. Would you consider that to be a high probability match? Yes. And how would you express that or how did you express it in your report? Um, we tend to say a high degree of scientific certainty. Now, when you're comparing um, sand from a location such as where Ms. Williams' body was found, can that sand or soil maintain its, its uniqueness and its um, chemical um, composition as far, as far as presence of different elements and the proportions in which they exist in rel relation to each other? Can that be maintained for... Um, uh, great time periods. Yes, and in fact, um, in some sediments we've analyzed, in other cases, uh, we've found that the integrity of the, the chemical residue has been maintained over hundreds of years. Can I have one moment, Your Honor? Yes. I'll tender the witness, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I believe you indicated that the sample that's from the back seat of the Lexus is the one that appears to be closest to the uh, sample that was collected from the location where the victim was located. Is that, is that accurate? The, the sample that comes from the back seat of the Lexus, when you compare it to the other known samples, that uh, is 99.5% similar to the one that is where the victim's body was located. Is right. that, okay. Um, you indicate in your report that the soil samples from the front passenger side of the Lexus um, closely matches the aggregate samples, and you number them 1061, 1062, and 1063, mm -hmm. recovered from the parking area. Mm -hmm. Where is that? I'm not certain. It's, um, that was the label that was on the sample. Okay. Um, Do you know whether or not that was on the Courtney Campbell Bridge, or you don't know? I don't know. Okay. 
the soils that you would expect to find, are you familiar with the Courtney Campbell Causeway? Yes. Okay. Um, apart from the um, exposure that the soils may have to, I believe you refer to it as the uh, human activity, would you expect that the soils that are on the causeway, uh, the Courtney Campbell Causeway, to be fairly similar? In, in, as far as the uh, the substance of them, similar to what? each other. Uh, it just depends on the particular area of the causeway and the different kinds of activities that have impacted different areas. Okay, but I'm saying prior prior to the human um, activity, I think you you indicated the human activity is really what helps make a particular sample more unique, right? Yes. Okay. So prior to that part of it, I, and I assume that's that includes. Um, uh, cars traveling over it, uh, oils and chemicals being spilled on it, all those types of things, right? Okay. Is that, is that a, a yep. fair, all, fair all assumption? That. All of that, yeah. Okay. And, and so if there is a um, service road on both sides of the Courtney Campbell Causeway and it has similar human activity uh, on both sides, would you expect the samples on either side to be fairly <laughs> similar? No, because each uh, area uh, has its own uh, impacts by different activities, by different people, um, fishing, picnicking, sure. and a wide variety of things. So. Sure, sure. And so, so clearly you were talking about how samples could remain the same for hundreds of years, but I think you're also suggesting that they can also change very quickly based on the, the activity that's going on in the area of, of, the, of these samples. No, the samples um, would not remain the same over hundreds of years. I said that the chemical residues would remain and not, uh, would okay. not leave. But the samples are a palimpsest of all the various activities that have happened. Do you have any knowledge, uh, were you able to examine any soil samples that were collected from the southeast, the southeast side of the Courtney Campbell Causeway that you know of? I, uh, the samples that I analyzed were simply the ones that were provided to me. Okay, which is the, the first sample that's brought to you is the sample from where the body is located, right? Mm -hmm. And you didn't ask for that, they brought you that sample, correct? Right. And then you asked them to go out and get some other samples from their random areas. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, not random areas, but areas uh, that would be, serve as controls. Okay. Did you specify to them where they should go and get these other samples? In general, yes. Okay. All right. So, and that's how they end up going to the beach, halfway between the beach and, and the bridge, and then maybe taking another sample on the bridge itself. Right. Okay. If you had been asked to evaluate samples, even multiple samples, uh, from the southeast part of the causeway, would you have been able to take those samples and go through the same process and evaluate those samples? Yes. And, and obviously, because you didn't have the opportunity to do that, we have no idea what the percentages would have been on those. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Dr. I had forgot to ask you this. During your analysis, your geochemical analysis, the actual, the actual use, um, plasma mass spectrometry, um, is there a control that you use in that analysis to, to ensure reliability of the analysis? During the analysis, we uh, run standard solutions. So these are um, solutions that, are, that have a known concentration for each of the chemicals in our analysis. And those are provided by uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That's part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, so we run those, uh, and we also run uh, blanks. So we run uh, samples of just that concentrated acid without any sediment in it so that we know what is uh, zero. 
And I just want to reconfirm the findings as far as the back seat and the front seat. Um, Sample 94, which was recovered from the front passenger seat, most closely matches um, aggregate of samples 1071, 1072, and 1073, which were recovered from the location of the victim. If that's what's in my report, yes. Okay. And you indicated there's a high degree of scientific certainty that sample number 94, which is from the front passenger seat of the Lexus, derives from the same type of geological material as that recovered from the location of the victim. Yes, that's what's written, yeah. Um, so that's the front passenger seat. It was the rear passenger seat that I believe you found had a match degree to the um, parking area, which previously has been testified to as being near the bridge of the Courtney Campbell Causeway right. at approximately 70%. That's right. Now, the 70%, would you consider that to be a match or a high, prob a high probability of scientific certainty? No, I would not. It's, it wouldn't be an exclusion, though, would it? No, I would consider it to be a, a sample of mixed sediments from multiple locations. Okay. And then there was one result that I didn't ask you about. Sample 94, again, from the front passenger seat of the Lexus, you indicated had a probability of 99 uh, 0.99.9 percent .9 for being associated with the location of the victim, and then you also found that it had a. And I, I'm sorry, I think you already testified to this. A 0041 or a 0.41 for being associated with a control sample from the Hyatt. That's right. Okay. Did you also conduct what's called a principal components analysis, which includes a covariance matrix, a Verimax rotation, a Kaiser normalization, and a regression factor score? And I'm reading from your report, Doctor. Um, which was performed to determine the goodness of fit between sample 93, rear passenger seat, sample 94, front passenger seat, <clears throat> and their primary groups, the parking area and the location of the victim. Yes. Okay. Did your analysis indicate that there is a very close match between sample 93, 93 the, the, the rear passenger seat um, soil that was found in the rear passenger seat, sample 94, the front passenger seat, and the aggregate of samples from the location of the victim? Yes. And that would be in addition to your findings as far as the front passenger seat soil matching the soil from where the victim's body was recovered. Right. And did you end, up, end your report in your conclusion section with the final statement, there is a high degree of scientific certainty that sample 94, which again is from the front passenger seat of the Lexus, derives from the same geological material as that recovered from the location of the victim? Yes. Yeah. I have no further questions, Your Honor. All right. Maybe uh, okay. I just want to make sure. I, I, I thought Mr. Harmon suggested it was 99.99. It's 99.59 percent match, right? If that's what's in the report, 99.5. You need to look at the report. Sure. Like approach on. Sure. Yes, it says 99.59. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Right. May this one be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're free to go. Thank you. All right, um, ladies and gentlemen, the jury, let's just take a quick five minute comfort break. All right, we will be back. See you then. All right, jury exiting. Okay, jury is at the courtroom. Um, who's left? Just Ivy Van Judge. So we'll be introducing the, the DVD. That's okay. one hour long. Okay. Um, and then. We have um, two exhibits.
want to introduce. So I can do that before we play it. That's fine. And then play it. I also have a transcript that I'll make a court exhibit, and then the disc will be the so The transcript will be court exhibit five, and the disc will be court exhibit six. Okay. Um, that's fine. And then you'll rest, correct? And then I'm assuming you all are familiar with the IV band testimony? Yes. Okay, so I need you all to be looking through the jury instructions. Okay? Multitasking. All right? Okay, very good. See you in a few.